Welcome to Behavior Grooves, the podcast that explores human behavior through a behavioral science lens. I'm Kurt Nelson. And I'm Tim Houlihan. We like to explore why we do what we do with researchers, authors, and practitioners in a conversational setting in order to bring those insights to you. And today's episode is about an important behavioral science lens to help us understand why we do the things that we do. It's a concept called tight and loose, and it was developed by Stanford professor Michelle Gelfand. Michelle is the author of Rule Makers, Rule Breakers, How Tight and Loose Cultures Wire the World. And we've been wanting to speak with her since the book came out a couple of years ago. Yeah, her research comes from being a cross-cultural psychologist. So Michelle and her colleagues explore the ways we do things across cultures. She studies ways which Americans might be similar or different from Germans or Brazilians. And she does that through this tight and loose lens. So actually, social norms are one of the best human inventions. I think about them as a great gift um, that we developed and, and um, perfected over millennia. Uh, but it turns out that groups vary in how strictly they abide by social norms. They're what we call tight cultures that have strict uh, rules and enforcements uh, for those rules versus groups that tend to be more permissive. We call them looser groups. And by measuring tightness and looseness, we can better understand the mindsets and general dispositions that could influence the way cultures and behavioral science collide. Or, as Michelle says, understanding tightness and looseness make culture more visible. And I want to take a minute right here to make note to our listeners. By the time this recording happened, Tim and I had been trying to lock down a recording date with Michelle for eight months. We had scheduled dates that fell through over and over and again. I think there were seven or eight times we had to reschedule Tim. Is that about right? That sounds about right. So, yeah. so when this recording uh, date came around and I was not feeling well, we decided that Tim should record with Michelle solo. What that means is that you won't hear my made-for-radio voice asking Michelle any questions because I wasn't there. Oh, man. Okay, Tim. So what did you guys talk about when I was missing? I'm sure Michelle was very happy that she didn't have to hear me. But no, what did you she guys was... – well, you were happy at least. I was elated. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I was not. It was kind of weird, actually. But, you know, we talked about the various ways the tight, loose lens might apply to governments and their citizenry about responding to the pandemic. We touched on how important it is for corporate leaders to be ambidextrous in the way that they lead to, to deal with both tight and loose approaches, um, which was especially true in being authentic to the cultural ecosystem of the organization to determine how tight or loose they need to be when evaluating things like return to office policies. And this got us to discussing two pretty interesting ideas, flexible tightness and structural looseness. Okay. Those two concepts sound really cool. Okay. And, and I, I, while I wasn't there, I did listen. So you also touched on moral foundation theory and how it yeah. might impact mask wearing in light of the tight loose model. All in all, it was a cool, a very cool discussion. And we are sure that you, our listeners, are going to be able to take some important les lessons away from this and her very energetic conversation. Yeah. But before we get to Michelle, we would like to ask if you do us a favor or two, uh, two favors, actually. OK, uh, the first is to dive into that follow the rules part of your tight mindset and scroll down to the bottom of the behavioral groups listing on your podcast app, whatever you're listening to, and give us a quick rating or leave us a short review. Uh, hashtag, I'm just asking for a friend. <laughs> <laughs> you're not asking for a friend. You're asking for you. Be honest here. Here we go. Yes. All right. The second favor is a favor actually to help Michelle. So go out to Michelle's website, which is... Wait for it. MichelleGelfand.com. That's M-I-C-H-E-L-E-G-E-L-F-A-N-D dot C-O-M. One L in Michelle. Thank you. That's a survey on her. And there's a, I'm sorry. And there's a survey on her site that will determine if you're a leaning loose or a leaning tight type person. And we think you might have some fun with it. 
I, it's super fun. Uh, we did it, and it, I thought it was a blast, actually. Um, you'll also be providing some data to a researcher, which is sort of like slathering extra butter on your toast. I got to tell you, man, it's a good thing to give them more data. So please head over to her site and take the survey. It's fun. <laughs> <laughs> slathering more butter on your toast. Okay. Um, it, please, please do jump to the place where you can leave a rating and reviews for Behavioral Grooves and take a moment to share your thoughts with the world. Reviews and ratings impact podcast apps algorithms on when our show gets put in front of other people who are exploring the topic, and it makes a big difference for getting the word out. Uh, so please take a moment to follow the rules and give us a rating. Okay, with that, we ask you to sit back with a nice pour of structured looseness and enjoy our conversation, or well, the, the conversation that I had with Michelle Gelfand. Michelle Gelfand, welcome to Behavioral Grooves. It's great to be here. I'm so glad to have you here. Uh, just want to get started with a couple of simple questions. Would you prefer coffee or tea? Definitely coffee. Definitely coffee. D tea ever? Mm, every so often, but mostly co high, high caffeinated. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, good. Okay, <laughs> okay good. Um, so uh, th this should be a, a super easy one too. Vacation on a fixed itinerary or no itinerary at all? I would say no itinerary. Okay. You kind of mentioned in the book that there might be a correlation between that and the tight and loose stuff, yeah. might, right? We might want to come back to that. Yeah. Um, okay. Does innate personality or environment have more impact on whether you're a Bert or an Ernie? Oh, that's a trick question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say both. You know, there's all sorts of really cool stuff going on on, you know, yeah. gene culture co-evolution. So I, I would say affirmatively, Yes. <laughs> Bravo. <laughs> I love that. Uh, okay. And does a diverse culture tend to make uh, the society tight or loose? Uh, that's a great question. It, it's actually curvilinear because in general, you know, diversity pushes us towards looseness, but as cultures get super diverse, you know, think Pakistan, India, uh, many, many languages, um, they start to get tighter. So it's actually uh, a nonlinear relationship. Yeah. So we're talking about uh, rule makers and rule breakers. And for those people who haven't read the book, which we have to recommend you go and read the book because it is a fantastic read. Uh, can you just share uh, the thesis of the book? Sure. You know, so the book is about these deep, deeper cultural codes that drive our behavior. So I study culture. I'm a cross-cultural psychologist. Um, and culture's a real puzzle. It's omnipresent. It's all around us, but it tends to be invisible. We take it for granted. It's just like that story about fish in the water. You know, the two fish are swimming along and one fish passes by them and says, hey, boys, how's the water? And they swim on. They say, you know, what the heck is water? And, you know, so this is really just another example of like sometimes the most important realities around us uh, are the most taken for granted and invisible. And for fish, you know, that's water. But for humans, that's culture. So this book is trying to make culture visible uh, and illustrate how it's affecting everything from our nations to our neurons. And in particular, the book focuses on the strength of social norms, these kind of unwritten rules for social behavior. And what's fascinating is that universally, you know, humans follow social norms uh, from a very early age. Uh, we can see children uh, are starting to really become uh, rule followers. We need them to really organize our action. I mean, if you think about it, think about a world without social norms where people are like stealing food off each other's plates and, you know, shouting in the library and having sex at movie theaters, you know, there's a reason why we don't do these things. Like it's right. because we invented social norms to help us kind of uh, enforce behaviors that we view as appropriate. Um, so actually social norms are one of the best human inventions. I think about them as a great gift um, that we developed and, and um, perfected over millennia. Uh, but it turns out that groups vary in how strictly they abide by social norms. They're what we call tight cultures that have strict uh, rules and enforcements uh, for those rules versus groups that tend to be more permissive. We call them looser groups. And we were just interested in the last decade in, in understanding this distinction. It actually was first discussed by Herodotus and studied in anthropology, but we started to really measure this um, in modern psychological science. And uh, we wanted to understand, you know, why do cultures vary on tight loose? Uh, what's the logic and what are the trade-offs that it confers to human groups? Uh, so we talk about all sorts of levels of analysis from the nations to states to organizations and even to our own inner Muppet 
as you mentioned. <laughs> and so um, it's really a tour de force of, of what we know about uh, this aspect of culture. Uh, that's a great tee up to come back to the Bert and Ernie question. Can you tell us a little bit about how Bert and Ernie relate to tight and loose? Um, yeah, well, I might, um, if you don't mind, maybe we could kind of uh, first talk about the national level. I mean, if we could just, uh, just sure. kind of rewind, because I, I think that um, it's, well, actually, let me, let no, me. No, 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 no. Let's, let's talk about the national level. What, what, what happens at a, at a cultural level across the country, across countries? Yes. Yeah, so um, as I mentioned, we can measure tight and loose and see that there's great variance around the world in terms of the strength of norms. Um, and I should mention that all cultures have tight and loose elements. So it's really about a continuum of how much you kind of emphasize tightness across domains or looseness. And, and what we found in this study that was published in Science about a decade ago is that we can classify cultures in terms of a degree of tight loose. It's like a continuum. So places like Singapore and Japan, uh, to, to some extent, Germany, Austria tend to veer tighter. Uh, cultures like New Zealand, Brazil, the Netherlands, the U.S. tend to veer looser. Um, and, you know, this is a distinction that we could see is distinct from things like collectivism and individualism. It's distinct from GDP. Um, so it's it's a unique aspect of culture. And, you know, there's nothing that we found at first that could unite tight cultures on the one hand and loose cultures on the other in terms of wealth or language or location. But what we found um, with that was that actually there is something that explains this variation. And it has to do with how much threat nations have faced over the course of their histories. Um, threat can be from mother nature, think like chronic national disasters and uh, or famine. It could also be human made in terms of the amount of invasions you have on your territory. And the, the principle is pretty simple. When you have a lot of threat, whether it's human made or naturally made, you need stricter rules to help you coordinate because norms really help that serve that function of coordination. And that's what we found in this study. We found that nations that have a lot of historical threat um, and modern threat tend to veer tighter. And those that tend to have less threat veer looser, they have more permissiveness, they can afford to be more permissive. Um, and, you know, this is not just about uh, nations. We can see this in organizations, organizations that have a lot of coordination needs and safety types of threats, think airlines or hospitals or police tend to veer tighter. And startups and design firms and places that have more of an innovation focus tend to veer looser. And we can also then look at our households even. How much do we as parents um, develop strict norms and rules or are we a little looser? Even our own mindsets, your own inner Bert you know, or Ernie, how tight or loose is your mindset um, also varies reliably around the world. And you can actually take the quiz uh, on my website to see where you veer. I'm curious if you took it, Tim. I did. Uh, okay. I, truth be told, I veer moderately loose. Uh, my husband, who's a lawyer, where there's a lot of accountability, veers moderately tight. And we have a lot of conversations about how I load the dishwasher. He gets deeply disturbed about this. <laughs> um, um, so, you know, there's it's really a fractal pattern that we see across levels of analysis um, and it has interesting trade-offs, and that's what the book is all about. Uh, our our team took uh, took the quiz and found that there's kind of a mix, of, about a half and half between moderately <laughs> loose and moderately tight. Wow. Uh, uh, would you have guessed that of podcasters? <laughs> well, you know, I think um, we all have reasons why we fall on the default that we do, based on our own personal histories with threat, with mobility, with uh, our exposure to different cultures, uh, which, as we mentioned, um, can actually push more towards looseness. Even our occupations, you know, also um, can push us toward tight and loose. It's important to mention that we all can switch modes really pretty rapidly. Like when you go to a symphony or you go to um, a library, like our inner Bert kind of comes out, right? We start following rules. We start being attentive to rules. We try to prevent, you know, doing stuff that's ridiculous, like starting to, you know, shout in the library. We manage our impulses a little bit better. Um, we're okay with that kind of structure. It kind of reduces the variability in these situations. And when we're in parties or public parks, like our, our inner Ernie might kind of come out because then we can be a little looser in our mindset. So it's fascinating that we actually navigate tight and loose all the time on a daily basis. But we also have a default in terms of where we are in the comfort zone of rule making and rule breaking. 
Um, and, you know, actually this lot of hidden conflicts that stem from tight loose in, in households and communities and organizations. Um, so I think it's important, as I mentioned, because culture is invisible, to really try to make it more visible, try to understand where do we fall on, our, on this mindset? Why might that be the case? And then think about your partners, your friends, your kids, or your boss or colleagues, like where do they fall? And maybe a little empathy here. Like I know you've been talking about that on your podcast, thinking about why might they veer tight or loose? And what's fascinating even beyond that is then to actually start to negotiate it. Uh, you know, I also study negotiation. So I'm constantly thinking about how do we manage conflict in productive ways. And, you know, as I mentioned, my own household, you know, Todd veers tight, I veer loose. So we, we have to sit down and think about like what domains should be tight in this household and what domains could be looser. Um, and every household might solve that problem differently, but you know, then we could talk about it with our kids. I have two teenage girls. They're probably sick and tired of hearing about tight loose, the poor things. They're definitely not interested in social science. The older one's in marine biology. The other one is going to go into oceanography. You know, somehow I lost them on the, on the social science, you know, kind of quest. Uh, but in any event, it's really exciting to think about, you know, how do you trade off on tight and loose and, um, manage the differences. You know, you mentioned vacations and it's interesting. We go to Cape May, New Jersey every year for the last 20 years with my extended family, my sibling, my dad. And that's a prime source of tight loose conflict. Like how much spontaneity do you want on vacation? How much structure? You know, we often have to negotiate this. Um, again, it comes up in so many contexts in the book. I have a whole chapter that's de dedicated to just the tight loose mindset. Yeah, the, uh, let's. I want to explore the, the since there's variability at a national level, there's variability, you know, at states, the uh, whole bunches of variability. Uh, one of the, the things that is fascinating to me is the variability within each of us individually. And yet you said we have a default. What, are, what do you think, uh, what are the factors that influence our personal defaults yeah. most? This is a great question. And we're doing lots of research on this now. Um, you know, by... As a general principle, as I mentioned, the more people have experienced threats, um, whether real or imagined, um, can make us desire stricter rules. It just makes good sense from an evolutionary point of view that when we have threat, um, that we want some something to rely on, some kind of safety, safety measures and rules help in that function. Um, I would suggest also that um, age and other demographics also can be related to tight loose. For example, you know, when you're younger, you don't have as much accountability, so you can afford to be looser. Not in all cultures, of course, we're, this is going to be constrained by the context, the national context. But um, as you get older and you get more embedded in your roles in organizations or as parents, you know, that would push us to being a little bit tighter in any context. I think one of my recent pet theories has to do with when we become parents. Like, that's pretty threatening. I don't know, for any of your parents out there, you know, when you're taking that kid, that little baby from home from the hospital... I, I, my kids were born at Sibley Hospital in Washington, D.C., and I remember saying, are you sure you're going to let me take this baby home? Like, what qualifications do I have to be a parent? It's a very threatening situation. So I would bet some money, maybe the college education funds of the kids, which I often do, <laughs> I would bet some money that parents veer tighter, especially and even pregnant women, you know, because of the feeling of threat. Um, you know, I mentioned to you in one of our emails that we just created a new dictionary to assess threat. Uh, it was published just a couple weeks ago in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science. So you can analyze any text online, uh, speeches, et cetera. And, you know, what we find is that across the last hundred years, that more threatening language in text predicts shifts in tightness, um, among other shifts. And so I think we can start thinking about how people talk and how that might help us diagnose the kind of mindsets that they have, the kind of feelings of threat that they have, again, whether real or imagined. Uh, the other thing I'll mention, some of the work that we're doing, which I think is really fascinating, is that um, looking at gender and minority status, stigmatized individuals. And what we're finding is that um, women and minorities tend to live in tighter worlds. That is to say that, you know, they're held to higher standards for the same kind of punishments. And, and we have some data that we published in Psych Science that looked at even like managers rating the deviant behavior of individuals in their organization, whether... Um, it was coming to work late or, you know, tampering with equipment or talking too much on the phone, like these kind of rule breaking situations. What we find is that consistently women and minorities are held to uh, more strict standards for the same behavior. So I think there's a lot of really interesting variation um, that we're starting to look at at the individual level. 
But I would love to hear your audience take the quiz and write to me. Let me know your own stories about tight loops. I've gotten a lot of them um, coming in from all over the world. And, you know, I think it's really helpful for us to know, you know, what people have experienced with this construct in their own daily lives, the conflicts they have of which there are many. I write about some of them in the book, but we're now collecting a lot of conflicts that stem from tight and loose so that we can help people negotiate them, as I mentioned. We have listeners in, in over 170 countries, and so we're going to uh, absolutely be pushing the idea of take the damn quiz because, <laughs> because we want you to gather more data. Uh, you wrote the book pre-COVID, and uh, so it, it pre-COVID, you couldn't have been anticipating uh, the idea of spread of, of disease. And yet you spoke to it. You addressed it directly about how strong social norms thwart the spread, the thwart the spread of disease. Sorry, English is a second language. Um, <laughs> My husband tells me that. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> how, uh, so how does tightness and looseness of cultures uh, affect the world's reaction and dealing with COVID, do you think? Yeah. It, it, well, did it play this, out in a way that was predictable? Yeah, well, this is such an interesting question. I mean, as, as a cross-cultural psychologist, um, you know, I never would have imagined um, that I'll you know, start, start studying uh, a global threat, you know, in my own scientific world. I've been studying threats in history with pre-industrial societies and threats in modern nations, but not something that everyone is now subject to the same threat. I mean, it was um, it was really um, some uh, credible research. Um, well, yeah, I'll just start over. You know, so it was the, the first time that we could really, as social scientists, study, you know, a global threat and how different countries are reacting to that threat. And I will say that, um, you know, I remember I was on a plane going to Breckenridge with my kids right when COVID was starting to hit. And I was getting really nervous. On that plane ride, I wrote an op-ed that I published in the Boston Globe that started to say, hey, you know, culture matters in these situations. Like there's an evolutionary basis for tightening during threat. We've done it before in 9-11. We've done it in World War II, you know, but I was starting to get nervous that we were kind of a disorganized mess already in early March, 2020. And it occurred to me that, you know, we, we've we never really looked to see whether pandemics are different than things like warfare. Warfare is really visible. It's concrete. It's You can't ignore it. Whereas a global pandemic, a germ, kind of abstract, easier to ignore. And the other thing that we thought about was that, well, we've never really looked to see whether looser cultures respond more slowly to global threats than tight cultures who have had the experience and the, have, have the, you know, the history to say that rules matter during threats so we can temporarily tighten during the situation. So I wrote the op-ed just to say, hey, you know, we've done this before, but we really need to take culture into account. This is not just about medicine. This is about culture. And, you know, long, lo and behold, you know, as the months, you know, proceeded, we started developing some computational models, seeing that, yeah, actually loose cultures are taking longer to tighten and cooperate under that. Then we started getting data uh, on cases and deaths. Uh, and by, you know, the late fall 2020, we, um, we submitted a paper that was published the, the next year in the Lancet Planetary Health that showed, you know, across 57 countries that looseness was a real liability. Loose cultures, um, as measured like before the pandemic, uh, had five times the number of cases and they had not, almost nine times the number of deaths. And this is controlling for lots of different factors, trying to get rid of this effect, you know, looking at wealth and inequality and density and all sorts of things. Uh, but it's a pretty robust effect. Um, the, the most astonishing thing that we found, this was on a smaller sample that was based on data from uh, YouGov in the UK, was that loose cultures ironically had less fear of COVID, like uh, in terms of like how scared they were of COVID from, you know, the first hundred days in a country to even the late fall. We could still see that tight cultures, even though they had much more success with dealing with cases and deaths, were still more scared about it. So that threat signal, that fear signal is really important. And if it gets thwarted, if it gets muted, if it gets interrupted or manipulated, then tightening doesn't happen. And that's the, what we learned the hard way. Um, so uh, I want to mention not all cultures got this wrong. Uh, places like New Zealand were able to pivot. They were more ambidextrous, as we call now. They were able to tighten um, at a very incredible national scale with great leadership. And also with cultural codes that say, if if some people are going to have to tighten, we're all going to have to tighten. It's a very egalitarian place where tall poppies are shut down, you know, cut down. 
So that egalitarianism of like, hey, guys, like if we're all required to do this, then no one's getting off the hook. And I heard from my colleagues that they were their phones were off the hook reporting people not behaving themselves during COVID. So that's just to say that not all cultures that were loose pre-COVID had struggled, but many did. So I, I want to say we call this now a cultural evolution mismatch, you know, and it's fascinating concept coming from evolutionary biology that really refers to the fact that certain traits that might be really great in one environment, when the environment shifts, um, they might be really maladaptive. Um, and this was the, the example I gave in a, in a paper I wrote, uh, was in the op-ed I wrote in The Guardian, was this, this phenomenon of the dodo bird, the poor bird was just flying around and very friendly uh, in Mauritius uh, context. And then when humans arrived, they were still really friendly. They didn't realize like humans are a huge threat to them. And they actually were wiped out in within a generation or two. So it's, you know, those like uh, fearless traits that really are great for innovation and for tolerance and for many things. Our optimism as a country is an enormous asset, but not during a collective threat. <laughs> so um, this is what we call cultural evolution mismatch. I've written about it recently in a paper on my website. And uh, I think it's there's a lot we've learned about what went wrong during COVID that hopefully will uh, will help us in the invariable next you know threat that we have. I, I, Michelle, I tend to think of the United States as, uh, and I think you, you described this, the United States as being relatively loose right? A little more on the, on the looser side. Was there a certain aspect of predictability in the way the United States responded based on what you know about these tight, loose norms? Well, I think that, you know, as I mentioned, under collective threat, um, cultures typically tighten. They, type will ten- they tighten temporarily because it's and, and, and adaptive. Did, and did you see, was your perception the United States did tighten up a, a bit? Mm, I think there was a tremendous amount of uh, conflict and, and un- disorganization and resistance. I mean, this is what we learned when the concrete, when the threat is not super concrete uh, and when leadership is telling us, don't worry about this. Um, it's really easy to ignore, you know, it's quite inconvenient to be in a global pandemic as we know yeah. uh, from an economic point of view, from a safety point of view. Um, and especially in loose cultures where, you know, we have been separated by two oceans from other continents we haven't had to worry about constant invasions from Mexico and from Canada. At least many of us think that. Um, my, my kids asked me that we, when they were younger. Do we have to worry about Canada invading us? It's a funny question from a kid. You know, we don't. We're, we've had our share of threat, of course, but not chronically like in other cases. So I think the lesson that we learned is that, you know, there's more reactance to being told we have to follow new rules in loose cultures where we haven't had the history of, of chronic threat that reminds us that, Following rules actually is a good thing during collective threat. We, of course, had lots of partisanship um, that really was problematic. I mean, what's interesting um, is that social scientists, as you know, you've interviewed many guests that focus on, you know, our moral codes and on politics and so forth. And what's fascinating is that for decades, scientists have shown that conservatives are way more threat sensitive even in the brain, you know, that there is just more neural activity when it comes to threats among conservatives. But we know that this flipped during COVID. The, the conservative tighter states were the most resistant to mask following, to uh, you know, even recognizing that COVID is uh, a real threat. And what it's to me, there's a pretty, you know, what we see is a rationale of what happened here. You know, if your leader is telling you this doesn't matter then that's interrupting that fear signal. Um, and, you know, that that's really what I think was going on um, during COVID and why we saw such a huge shift um, in terms of conservatives versus liberals uh, following rules. We're, we're a month and a half into uh, Russia's invasion of the Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine is has been uh, a generation out of the Soviet Union, uh, what do, what kind of impact do you anticipate is going to happen? Well, I mean, they're under imminent threat. The whole country yeah. is. I uh, think that, that what we see is a perfect example of tightening under threat. You know, we see, you know, the Ukraine has a great sense of national identity. And I think that's one of the things also we lacked during COVID that really, um, really, I think, predicted our, our higher cases and deaths. It's, it's a simple idea that if you're, if you feel like we can, collectively deal with this threat together and we're all in this together, 
um, then we understand the need for sacrificing our liberty for more constraint. And again, it's temporary. I think that's what we have to really uh, help people to understand. So I think that there's tremendous amount of national unity uh, in the Ukraine. And that's what we see, you know, that they've been, you know, sacrificing and, and coming together in ways that we couldn't have imagined. It is amazing. I was on the on a call this morning with someone from Romania who said that that they're going to be uh, spending a few weeks in Turkey so that they can make their home available for for uh, refugees uh, yeah. coming from Ukraine. And uh, it's amazing to me. Like there's there's a real sense of regional response to this as well. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. I think there's also a lot of um, a lot of fear. Is, is this going to happen to us next? Like yeah. we need to unite with our neighbors because we know that, you know, it could be coming into our territory. And so this is what we're seeing a lot in Poland as well. Um, so I think that you're, you're, you're on to something that this is something that is becoming contagious across different cultural boundaries. Right. Right. But of course not here uh, in the United States because we're, an ocean away from, from them. Yeah. And you know, I, I did want to say that, um, you know, I, I do talk in the book a lot about what we call the tight loose trade-off, you know, no culture has, you know, all strengths and no liabilities. Um, we can think about um, both tight and loose as having great strengths, but also having a lot of kind of weak spots and liabilities that other cultures, you know, the rever- or the reverse in, in tighter cultures. And so in the book, we talk a lot about, what we call the order versus openness trade-off. And, and so tight cultures in general have a lot of order. Um, they have less crime. They have a lot of monitoring uh, in terms of like police per capita and um, security cameras. We've seen this in city streets around the world that we've studied. They also have a lot more synchrony. Um, even the clocks in city streets are more synchronized in tight cultures. In the book, I provide some data on this. You know, when you're in uh, places like Germany or Japan, like the clocks in city streets are off by milliseconds. But when you're in a place like Brazil or Greece, like you're not, you know, the clocks are pretty different. You're not t- <laughs> That's a good unobtrusive measure of coordination. Uh, but even other aspects of coordination you know, what people drive and what people wear are going to be more similar in tighter cultures. Those kind of visible indices of synchrony, even some data from economics, financial economics found that s- stock prices and, and buying and selling of stocks is more synchronized in tight cultures, controlling for lots of things. So there's more sort of together in this synchrony coordination in tight culture that speaks to that order. And there's also more self-discipline. So there's we have lots of data on impulse control, uh, like we were talking about with, you know, Bert and uh, <laughs> and our order Muppets. Um, there's more um, there, there's in tight cultures have less obesity controlling for factors, uh, other factors. They have less drug abuse, less debt even. So they have higher wow. self-regulation. And you can think about, you know, loose cultures struggle with, the loose cultures tend to have less uh, order, less, they have more crime, they have less synchrony, and they have a host of self-regulation failures. Uh, even from my book, I, I found that loose cultures actually have pets that tend to be more obese. My, my, my dog has been pretty obese, actually. (laughs) Um, Not all loose cultures struggle with order, but many do. Uh, But loose cultures tend to corner the market on openness. And that means that they have more tolerance. I mean, all cultures struggle with tolerance, but comparatively speaking, loose cultures have more openness to immigrants and to stigmatized individuals, people from different races and creeds. Um, We even sent out our our arrays around the country. This is kind of a crazy study where (laughs) We had some of them wearing like fake facial warts that I bought them on the internet. And another condition, they were wearing tattoos and nose rings and purple hair. And in a third condition, they were just wearing the normal face. And we wanted them to go out and ask for help on city streets to get directions uh, and also to get help in stores. It's a, a paradigm that was developed by um, Mickey Hebel and other social psychologists trying to see out there in the world, how do people treat people with stigma? And what we found was really fascinating when people were just wearing the normal face and asking for help, there was no difference across cultures in helping behavior. But when they were wearing these weird facial warts or these tattoos and so forth, they got far more help in loose cultures and far less help in tight cultures. So there's more openness. Um, there's more creativity, more idea generation in looser cultures. Uh, there's lots of interesting studies on crowdsourcing contests of creativity and what they found was that people from loose cultures are more likely to enter those contexts, they're more likely to win. 
And, and there just tends to be more of that kind of openness to change in general. Um, we found that in computational models too. So, you know, you can think about this as an order openness trade-off. Tight cultures corner the market on order, but they struggle with openness and, and vice versa. And so I think the key is for us to start thinking about how can we be more ambidextrous? How can we in any social system try to maximize both order and openness? It's a, it's a really fundamental question um, that we're now doing quite a bit of work on. Uh, what do you think uh, will be the stronger traits to bring forward, tightness or looseness in bringing employees back to the office? Uh, this is such an interesting question. And we've been studying this uh, during COVID, you know, which organizations tended to be more ambidextrous, more resilient. How do you, uh, and this relates to also bringing people back, uh, how do you create systems that have both latitude and constraints uh, that give people flexibility, but also, in, you know, accountability? And we, we're starting to study this in various different contexts, whether it's the U.S. Navy or an online how do we help people to feel this dual sense of empowerment, but also felt accountability? And I think a lot of organizations need to solve that duality differently. You know, if you're in a manufacturing context or if you're in the surgical room, like, you know, rules are really important, but there's also a sense that you need some flexibility in those systems. It's what we call flexible tightness. Uh, on the flip side, some organizations that veer looser, like in high tech, you know, they obviously emphasize more looseness. That's the context, that ecology that you need lots of idea generation, but they also need some degree of monitoring and accountability. Um, and we call this structured looseness. How do you have some accountability, some structure that you can insert into that system? And so that's what we've been studying now is how to help leaders diagnose the levels of tight loose in their organizations and help avoid the extremes, you know, because the extremes at any system are really bad. <laughs> where there's extreme tightness, where you have uber monitoring and people feel like they're walking on eggshells and they can't speak and feel very unsafe. Or really loose contexts where they're chaotic and unpredictable. They're equally problematic. They're untenable. Yeah. That kind of chaos actually makes people desire a lot of tightness. We've seen this <laughs> pendulum shifts that happen at the extremes. So I guess the point I'm, that we're really interested in exploring is how to help leaders be more ambidextrous, to help diagnose their organizations and shift them as needed, adding a little more discretion in a tight system or adding a little more structure and accountability in a really um, super loose system. Uh, we're doing now, this online now, too. We're trying to develop ways in which we can help people be, kind of live in a more kind of tighter environment on, on online that still embraces difference and empowerment and open discussion. You know, how can we design a world we're living in online that is not so normless as, you know, and has anime as Durkheim would say. Um, so that's the kind of stuff that we've been starting to study. And I think it speaks to this more general idea that, look, if we can understand these cultural codes, we can and diagnose them, we can negotiate them and we could talk about them. Uh, like, why don't we talk about these things that are driving our behavior all the time and then and, and, and figure out the right balance, have this kind of intentional culture change is what we would, might call it. We talked to Sandra Sutcher at HBS uh, about how important it is for companies to sort of be authentic and, and uh, transparent about this is our company values. These are our company values. This is what we value. And sort of if you don't like it, you can go. Uh, but it, it needs to be sort of true to who they are. And what I hear you saying is that the context of what the culture already is, is highly influential in how, how flexible and how adaptive uh, they can be or should be, I suppose. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, you know, we know from our own work that people who have the tighter mindsets as measured on that quiz, like they are attracted to, they like the pl places that have a little more structure, have more accountability. Um, it feels like a, a nice congruency People who have looser mindsets kind of look at those contexts and say, yikes, like that feels kind of overly constraining. Uh, it's actually interesting. We're studying even people who start up, you know, these new firms and clearly they would have more loose mindsets. And the goal is to scale up, to get bought out. But what happens is that, you know, it, there's this tension between that loose mindset and this like now tighter world, which you need as you scale up in an organization. Yeah. And a lot of people I've talked to, they kind of become serial startuppers because they're like, oh, I got to get out of here and start something else. Like, I mean, this kind of happens over the course of our lives. Um, so I think there's a natural, uh, as Ben Schneider, my colleague in organizational behavior would say, attraction 
you know, that based on your own values. And then, you know, basically, you know, people get selected into organizations that seem to fit. And those that are kind of different wind up leaving. He calls it the attraction selection attrition model. And it also applies to tight loose as well. I'm just curious. Uh, I keep coming back to this from a personal perspective. I felt like I was a bit blindsided when I took the quiz. I didn't expect to be mildly loose. I thought I was going to be more radically loose, actually, uh, because a lot of the people around me are like, oh, Tim, you're so crazy. You do all these silly things and, you know, you're not a rule follower, blah, blah, blah. How big of a, how often, how, how common are blind spots? How, how common is, is a tight versus loose, a blind spot? Or, yeah. or is it, is it, is it more often like, well, yeah, we all know. Well, you know, I think, I think there, because it's invisible, there's all sorts of potential for blind spots. You know, we don't often, you know, think about, you know, are we rule makers or rule breakers and, and what contexts is that happening in and what context might you actually like rules and structure? Mm -hmm. Um, I I think that, um, probably you got a lot of feedback from your colleagues around your rule breaking behavior, but they might not see the inner Tim that is in some context, you know, uh, more structured or disciplined or whatnot. So I think, um, you know, it's also when you're answering the the scale, it sometimes people want to answer it in the way that they wish they were, you know, it's, it's, there's, so there's all, there's some social desirability. I would suggest that you give it to a bunch of your friends uh, and ask them to rate you and let's see what they do. Do a little 360 feedback. Um, <laughs> you know, I think, you know, my, it's interesting, you know, how people do, obviously have perceptions of others and, and we can then see what, what the perceptions are. My kids also vary a lot on this. Um, my older daughter veers looser than the younger daughter and they talk about it. They, you know, they kind of make fun of each other all the time about this. It's a source of like just camaraderie and, and they agree on it. Um, so it's often helpful to get other people's perceptions. So I would, I would send it out to your friends and family and see what they have to say. And also maybe you'll see a difference in context. Like maybe you're tighter at home or with your kid, if you have kids or, or maybe you're looser at the organizations, like that would be another interesting way to look at the data that you're getting back. Like what's the context, um, that you're in and more and more, we're starting to develop measures of tight loose that are more granular like that, like about like your tightness in your home versus your work versus your community organizations, your hobbies. Um, even in organizations, we can start, we can get measures of general amount of tightness and looseness, but we can also start looking at, well, how strictly regulated is the dress code or the language that people use or when and where and how they work. So we now have a new measure that gives profiles, like a little pattern of levels of norm strength for organizations. And what's nice about that is then you can sort of look at that and say, wait, do we really need to be so tight on this dress code? Like, what's that serving? Um, the, you know, all sorts of norms develop that might have been functional for a good reason in the past, but don't really serve any purpose now. And, and it's nice to try to look at that and, and, and think about, you know, what norms might be, you know, kind of prime candidates for changing. Um, my student discovered this great paper uh, called, it's, it's on silly norms. It's like, norms that we buy, abide by all the time, but like we don't really need to anymore. So I think there's the whole quest to understand this field of silly norms now. So when you can invite me back a couple of years, I'll tell you what, and it takes a while to coordinate our schedules, but if we start now, we'll find a time. And, you know, I can tell you more about, about that work. I, we, we that, let's make a date. Uh, I think that that's that's a fantastic idea. Uh, if we could, let's let's turn towards uh, your more current work because uh, since the book has been published, you you've you've published uh, dozens of peer reviewed papers. You're uh, super active. You're recently at Stanford. Congratulations, by the way. Thank you uh, on, on that. That's pretty fantastic. Um, tell us about what what's what are you excited about right now? I mean, you've got a lot of stuff going on, but we've got a little insight into what, yeah. what are you excited about? Well, you know, I, I'm a generalist, so I'm like hyperventilating all the time about all sorts of different research. Uh, our lab, the culture group is very interdisciplinary. We work with, uh, of course, psychologists and organizational behavior uh, scholars, but also we work with computer scientists, uh, evolutionary game theorists in particular. We work with big data, you know, linguistic scholars, developing dictionaries, uh, and we do neuroscience. We try to peer into the brain to see, you know, how is culture and brain? We have a couple of papers looking at um, cultural neuroscience um, and even how the brain reacts to threat in terms of um, how coordinated even, 
your brain waves become with others. So all sorts of crazy stuff. Um, Fantastic. You know, I, um, yeah, it's a great job. It's, I can't believe we get paid to do this. Um, so, you know, you asked me about nudges and, and, and tight loose cultures and one, we are really interested in sort of culture change and in the mechanisms through which cultures change. And we think they're going to be quite different. And this is important because a lot of, you know, places are going all over the world trying to make changes, whether it's in consumer behavior or in health and safety and things like that. And one of the papers we published recently was looking at the influence of values, personal values on behavior. And what we found, this is a, a study across numerous countries, was we found that in loose cultures, your values really predict your behavior very strongly, what you personally think is important, but they're much less predictive in tight cultures where people are following the norms and that raises some really interesting questions about culture change. Like, I think often, you know, we think about trying to change people's va values and attitudes. Like that's probably going to be uh, a much more important nudge in looser cultures. Mm -hmm. Whereas trying to really tap into the norms and the real, the norm setters, the people who are really respected in those contexts is going to be more impactful for culture change. Uh, there's also this question. We're really interested in pluralistic ignorance, which is where, you know, you might actually, um, value something, but you just assume everyone else doesn't. And so you act on that social norm. This started in some early work by Dale Miller and others, colleague of mine. And, and people have looked at like drinking behavior, like people in the US, they found personally don't really want to drink a lot, but they think others do. So they wind up acting on that norm and reinforcing a norm that doesn't even exist when it comes to attitudes. And so this pluralistic ignorance is something that might vary a lot across cultures, especially when you're not talking about your values a lot and you're abided by norms, it might be that, you know, people don't estimate actually as well what other people think in tighter culture. So we're interested in that. Um, we're also really um, interested in, um, as I mentioned earlier, like how do you shift from tight to loose or loose to tight and working with the U.S. Navy uh, in some projects and also some online media platforms um, that have different challenges. And, you know, I mentioned we also do all sorts of work on negotiation and conflict uh, and we do a lot of work in the Middle East on negotiation. And what's fascinating is, you know, I teach negotiation at Stanford and I've been teaching it for years. And we often think about like the getting to yes model, you know, kind of separating the person from the problem and being logical and factual. And, you know, it's it's really a great model for negotiation in the U.S. But in our data coming from the Middle East, it's there's a lot of assumptions that, you know, we have to question about that model. So we're doing all sorts of work on honor and negotiation, um, computational models and on the ground research uh, and developing some new understandings about negotiation around the world and, and what are the kinds of um, ways in which people get to yes differently around the world. So that's kind of, there's a lot of other stuff going on. Just uh, but So anyone that's interested, check out our website, michellegelfin.com and email me for any papers you want me to send you. I, I want to follow up on one uh, with, that we got a sneak peek at, uh, talk about the nudges. And this was about mask wearing between Democrats and Republicans. Uh, and can you, you there's a many, uh, many conditions that, that you tested there. Uh, could you talk a little bit about what your, what your hypotheses were, how you tested them, and then what your results were? Sure. So um, this is a multidisciplinary team. What we created, like right when COVID started, and we pre-registered the study at the Journal of Experimental Social Psych. It's on an intervention tournament, we call it, uh, inspired by the late uh, 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 colleague of mine at UPenn. Um, and what, basically what this does is it tests different interventions. In this case, we're trying to increase positive attitudes toward mask wearing and signing pledges, uh, committing to wearing masks and even sharing that pledge. So we had like attitudinal measures and also we had uh, some behavioral measures. And, you know, what we did was we got 5,000 uh, representative uh, of the U.S. sample uh, in terms of Democrats and Republicans. And we designed eight different interventions compared to a control group where, you know, you were just told that people, it's important to wear masks, but not told why it's important. And we tried to nudge people Based on moral foundations theory, you know, we, with the idea that, you know, Republicans might be more sensitive to disgust and to in-group and authority and patriotism reasons why we should wear masks, whereas liberals might be more attentive to fairness and these kinds of things. We also designed what um, Greg Walton at Stanford calls wise interventions. You know, we, they're not about moral foundations, but they're about why people might be reluctant to wear masks in this particular situation. 
What are the mechanisms? Things like, you know, that people don't trust the science about masks. So we develop nudges that we're, we're really at trying to persuade people that actually they're being shown to be very effective or that, you know, this is a real threat. Like how can we convince people that, you know, this is a threat and it's, it's here to stay unless we start protecting ourselves. Um, and so we randomly assigned people to, you know, these seven nudge conditions compared to the control. And, you know, the bad news is that none of our nudges worked. There was just incredible partisanship. Uh, it could have been the timing of our study. It could have been that these are short lived, you know, short primes. But, you know, nevertheless, it tells us about the limitations of, of uh, nudging during very severe um, times of polarization. Uh, we just, our, our only main effect was basically that Democrats were reporting wearing masks more and they were more likely to sign the pledge and share the pledge than Republicans. Uh, Republicans felt less fear uh, and that was driving a lot of our different results. Um, so, um, you know, this is a really important, you know, just indication of we need to figure out how to nudge people. We also asked uh, in a different study with Eugene DeMont and our colleagues uh, to forecast our tournament. What do they think? People out in the real world, these practitioners who are studying behavioral change, uh, and they also didn't, couldn't quite predict our results either. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's instructive that, you know, um, I'm glad we did the tournament. We learned a lot. But um, clearly, um, you know, what we've learned also is that it's the local context, trusted authorities like your barber or your pastor, you know, your rabbi are the people that really can be convincing in this context. Um, and I think had we included some condition <laughs> you know, that was really tapping into that uh, local authority, we might have been more successful, but that there's clearly been behavioral change in other contexts, just not through our tournament. Yeah, we've talked about uh, uh, reference networks with Chris, Christina Bicchieri about, yeah. about this, and that that's fascinating stuff. Yeah, she and I uh, are working together with Eugene on a special issue uh, that was just coming out on interdisciplinary perspectives on, on social norms, particularly bringing it into economics. So um, it's been really fun to work with her and Eugene on that and to broaden our disciplinary approach. You know, that's really where the field is these days. I, I love it. I absolutely love it. Um, before we go, we have to talk about music. And I have to just ask, uh, what, what's on your playlist? What, and, and by the way, has your playlist changed through COVID? Are you listening to different music today than you were two years ago? You know, it's a great question. So I'm on Pandora. I know my kids keep making fun of me. Like, mom, like you got to get up to speed with like, you know, all sorts of other apps. You 100% uh, <laughs> my support to stay on Pandora for as long as you walk. You can boycott Spotify intentionally or unintentionally yeah. forever as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. So I, my playlist is always like all things jazz um, and some classical music. But like when I, like every night, my go-to is on Pandora. I'm listening to Oscar Peterson, Les McCann, um, Dave Brubeck. Uh, I love Bossa Nova. And I also listen to a lot of Bossa. I have a Bossa Nova station. I have a Latin jazz station. So I'm kind of really obsessed with jazz. I credit my older brother, Larry Gelfand, for getting me into uh, jazz. I also listen to classical music. I'm a big fan of Bach. Um, I also like um, other artists too, but for sure, that's my go-to on classical music. The Brandenburg Concertos and other things. Yeah, why? Yeah, why? Why Bach? Just out of curiosity, I, I, I have this discussion with lots of people who are who are into into Bach, uh, and I there's lots of good reasons to love Bach. But for me, like Beethoven took you know the, with the Romantics just exploded everything. Yeah, it's uh, interesting. I mean, I just find it so incredibly. Um, his, his music is just intricately structured and peaceful. And I mean, I don't like all of it. Like I don't love fugues, but I love uh, the Brandenburg Concertos. Uh, I, 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 so I also listen to quite a bit of Mozart uh, and Vivaldi. So I'm also, you know, I have some other go-tos, but I'm, if you were to see my, my playlist, it, it would be, that's what I listen to 10 to in the morning. Um, and then at night, I'm always listening to jazz. And my dog, by the way, listens to jazz with me. That dog is a big jazz fan. I, I, you know, I'm telling you that she doesn't like opera, but she really likes jazz. I love your dog. Yeah. My <laughs> dog is, you know, she's 13 years old, Portuguese water dog. She's, her name is Pepper. We call her bougie. And she, that <laughs> dog, she thinks she's human. She, she doesn't like other dogs and she certainly loves jazz. <laughs> wow. Wow. So if, <laughs> I think that's just fantastic. If you were to be stuck on a desert Island for a year, heaven forbid, but if you were on a desert island for a year, what three musical artists would you choose to take with you? 
Uh, well, I think I would, as I mentioned, I would take Bach for the mornings and I would take, yeah. I would say probably Oscar Peterson because <gasps> if I had to choose one, I would just shoot Oscar. Yeah. I think the third one, I would choose some kind of meditation app. <laughs> You know, well, I mean, I would say like, I mean, there's music on that. Typically it's just nature sounds and things like that. But I would definitely bring like the Calm app with me because I'm a big fan of meditation okay. and listening to just nature. And um, it's an incredible gift meditation um, to the world. So I would definitely have that on my list. Michelle, let's hope that the desert island would have lots of good nature <laughs> sounds already. Just FYI. But <laughs> I don't know. You know, you didn't tell me whether I'm going to be like in the middle of like the Middle East desert. <laughs> that's true. Or if I'm going to be in the Caribbean, you know, on a private island, you know, that's, you're that's right. true. We'll that's really, really true. It, it could have, it could have been an island in the Persian Gulf or it could have been a, yeah, it could have been an island. Yeah. It, I, it it's since, um, I yeah. just came back from Middle East. So that's what that was my first, you know, that was my first thought when you mentioned that. Of course, of course. Um, lastly, we've, uh, we're occasionally, we, um, we keep updated with, uh, Melanie Brooks at, at Columbia. She's doing a little bit of research on do people listen to music while they work and under what circumstances. And so we just like to collect some antidotes, uh, for Melanie. And do you ever listen to music while you work? Yeah, it's such a good question. I mean, I, in fact, when I wrote the book, I was, I started out listening to music as I was writing the book, but then I, I tend to actually not be able to listen to music while I'm actually working, but I try to take breaks where I get like fired up by listening to music, okay. whether it's country music or like, you know, um, kind of disco music or the emotions or whatever, like that stuff gets me fired up. I'm a big jazzerciser. This is like an exercise, like also like lots of intense music. I've even gotten like pulled over by the police. Cause I was like speeding. Like I didn't realize I'm listening to music. I'm getting all psyched up. <laughs> It's definitely got to be careful with that. But um, so I tend to use music selectively to get fired up um, in between when I'm taking breaks rather than when I'm actually working. Because um, I find myself distracted by the music <laughs> otherwise. I think that that's fantastic, actually. Uh, Bob Cialdini said one of his his favorite things to do is to is to use uh, a little bit of priming with his audiences. That whenever he's introduced at a at an uh, an event, he likes to play Aretha Franklin's "Think" yeah. before before as he's walking on stage, just just to have that tiny little bit of priming, like so intentional. I love. Yeah, it. totally. I mean, we, people say psychologists are always using our psychology on people, you know, and yes. I think that, that's like. A good good example of that. Yeah. I have thought about you know studying music through a tight loose lens. Not surprisingly, you know, like mm -hmm. you know, because I'm you know can't not see it in lots of places. And I think we could prime tight or loose mindsets depending on the kind of music people are listening to, whether it's jazz or symphonies. Or it would be an interesting question around the kind of music that people are attracted to when it comes to their mindset. So let's see if Melissa will add that to her research agenda. Uh, let's let's ask. Let all we can do is ask. Michelle Gelfand, it is an absolute treat to have you as a guest on Behavioral Groups. Thanks so much for being with us today. Yeah, it was fabulous talking with you, Tim. Thanks for having me. Welcome to our grooving session where Tim and I groove on what we learned from Tim's discussion with Michelle. Have a free flowing conversation and talk about whatever else comes into our. I don't know, Tim, do you have a loose or tight brain? Which is it? I don't know. I'm pretty loose in my brain. I know that. Yeah. I'm leaning loose. Yeah, yeah, you're leaning loose. You're you're an American. You're an American. You, American. you lean loose there. American. Yeah. yeah. Is that how that works? Is it is it is it because we're American that we tend to lean loose? It can't help but influencing us, right? DNA. I, I, I go back to our conversation with John Barge. DNA is a big, big impact on our behaviors. But we have culture. DNA that comes from all over the world, but we're American. So it's, what's, what is culture. it about our American stuff that makes us loose? Well, so Michelle teed up this idea that it's we're on a continuum, okay. right? That, that so you you and I lean loose, but that doesn't mean that there might be some things in our lives that we're tight about, you know. Uh, you know the for instance uh, curfew for your your teenage kids, you know, you might be pretty tight about that. Um, so there are it's it's a continuum. There's a whole variety of things, and of course it changes by individual, by situation, by community, by state, by country, by culture, by circumstances. So. 
So we're not just one thing or the other. And I think this is what makes it so interesting is that there is this lovely sense of nuance about it. It's not just this binary thing. So so what I'm hearing you say is that culture and the country that you're in can influence it. But within there, there are other factors that also have an influence on that, whether that be right. an individual piece, a uh, circumstance piece, or other various different pieces on that, right? Yeah. Well, so uh, she gave the example of how the Ukrainian uh, Ukrainian people kind of live in a relatively tight environment because they've got Russia breathing down their neck, you know, for the last generation. They were part of, of the Soviet Union for many generations. Uh, and so when it came to responding to a threat, man, they acted quickly and decisively. You know, the U.S., on the other hand, uh, you know, I don't think the people who live in the United States are really worried about Canada or Mexico invading. <laughs> and I don't think that the Canadians wake up every morning sweating about whether or not the you know people from the United States are going to invade. You know, so it's easier for those these countries to be looser. Does, does it have any impact whether I'm, you know, maybe in a subculture within the country as well, if I'm a minority or – a woman or maybe Definitely. a, uh, I don't know, a basketball aficionado. I mean, <laughs> I, I don't know. I'm trying to think of stupid groups. A like a white guy that loves basketball. <laughs> um, I, I, Definitely women are absolutely, and minorities, um, they tend to live by tighter rules. Michelle's research proves that out in large part because they kind of to survive. It's kind of a survival thing. Women are always looking to protect their offspring. Mm. And so there is sort of a natural sense of they've got to look out for the, the kids. And that requires being a bit tight, not to not necessarily to be helicopter parents, but you have to look out for the well-being of somebody else. You're going to probably live by some tighter rules than someone who doesn't have to worry about that. And, and I'm assuming that with minorities, it's, it's something similar that you're you're looking out because you are a minority within a larger population. It's similar to the yeah. Ukrainian situation with Russia always kind of breathing down your neck. With a yeah. minority, you have the larger um, general population that you don't necessarily fit into. So you need to be maybe a little bit tighter within that. Is that the, the rationale? Yeah, yeah I, have, I have black friends who you know talk about giving their kids the talk uh, as they get closer to driving age about this is how you're going to behave when you get pulled over because it's not if it's going to be when and those are pretty tight rules um, and that's not just being paranoid that's about living with the reality of you know living by a pretty defined set of uh, you know uh, self-preservation rules basically yeah. and again yeah. context specific and situational and various different pieces along that so uh, you know yes. your listeners take that with for that one of the things that you guys talked about that i thought was really interesting is kind of threats right and and how yeah. covid is a threat and wars are a threat but we respond to them differently can you talk a little bit about that yeah well and she teed up this this idea again the the ukraine the ukrainian experience versus the american experience uh because of the the very immediate threats and they've lived with threats for some time um and and how uh, uh and how wars tend to be more visible and, and more obvious than uh, something like COVID. COVID is invisible. And so in a loose country like the United States, uh, that again, that leans loose, sort of do your own thing, there was a lot of chaos and, and dissent and disruption around what to do with, with COVID. And um, whereas she posited that if there was a, a major threat, uh, you know, a war, that it would still be difficult for the United States to kind of grip around it. Although she did, you know, uh, kind of reference that in World War II, everybody in the United States kind of got behind it as a, you know, unifying kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, I thought that was interesting because you can look back at World War II and you can see that. And, and we were yeah. living in a different time and a different, you know, era at that point. And I wonder if, because you look further, you know, less in the past and you look at the Vietnam War or you even look at, you know, what happened in Iraq and, and Afghanistan. Yeah. And you kind of wonder, did, I don't, feel like we coalesced in that tightness around those wars as much as we did in World War II. And so it's kind of a different era that we live in and maybe some different pieces that are coming from that. It's a it's a really interesting observation, Kurt. I'm, I'm glad that you shared that because 
there is sort of that trend. If we look at the arc from World War II to today, there's a uh, increase in dissent and chaos around even major threats like like wars. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so in some ways, you could have predicted that there would be this sort of dissent and chaos with regard to COVID, which is much less visible uh, to people. And, and you guys, but that didn't necessarily happen in all loose cultures, right? This, this dissent and chaos. Uh, yeah. So yeah, she, it, around she COVID. Talked about, yeah, she talked about New Zealand as being a pretty loose uh, country overall, again, leaning more loose. But they pivoted because of leadership, and they kind of agreed on a more egalitarian approach where, um, as she said, that the tall poppies get get cut down, right? That that people wanted to sort of toe the line and solve the problem together as a nation. And so they pivoted, pivoted from a very loose approach pretty quickly to a tight approach to respond to COVID. And she thought that was really cool. Yeah. So – one of the other interesting things that you guys talked about was this uh, what's a, a tight loose trade off right it, it's like oh mm-hmm. well we should be a tighter organization or, or culture or we should be a looser organization or culture one or the other isn't necessarily better but there is a trade off at some situations and sometimes one is better than the other can you talk a little bit about what you guys spoke there yeah, it, I have to tell you that when we were having this conversation, it reminded me of the way Sandra Sutcher talks about organizations sort of broadcasting their culture, their culture and their values. Because Michelle talks about the cultural ecosystem as being such an important aspect of of what companies are, right? And it's not so. And as you said, it's not good or bad to be tight or loose. It's more a matter of does it serve the organization? Uh, she started with talking about clocks in Berlin and Tokyo. Like they they are set perfectly within milliseconds. And because in some ways, like the culture expects that. That's the expectation. Yeah. But if you're in Sao Paulo, Brazil, yeah, whatever. You know, if the clock isn't right in the town square. Yeah. That like people don't have an expectation that the clocks are going to be perfect within a millisecond. So that that's sort of a cultural thing. But in in organizations, when we think about like tech companies are typically going to be looser. Mm-hmm. They're a little bit more wild west in terms in terms of the way the organizations function. Um, and and that's okay compared to the way a bank might run or insurance companies that are more highly regulated. They they need to be, you know, tighter. Well you guys talked about two really interesting concepts, right? This this idea of flexible tightness and structured looseness. Yeah, help me understand that a little bit better, and what what Michelle was saying about that. So this, th- these are fantastic. I think that these are really lovely juxtapositions to think about. So in in the insurance company or the bank that needs to run a relatively tighter approach, um, that they need to think about flexible tightness. Mm. They need to think about their tightness from a more flexible perspective because somebody's got to plan the uh, the holiday party you know and it, it you know there's got to be some some human aspect to the way the organization runs because it's people that work there they're not automatons yeah so so she emphasized this idea that flexible tightness could be beneficial to tighter organizations well and i think you know christian hunt who was a good friend of ours and we talk with all the time and he's talking about human risk and this idea of of yeah. human risk and organizations and how they set it up and i know he's always talked about you know you can't regulate your way out of you know these these elements that there's a human involved and you have to take that human side and it sounds to me and I don't know if this is the case or not, but it sounds to me like this flexible tightness kind of says that is all right. Yes. You can have very rigid rules and processes and procedures, but you also have to understand that you have humans operating within this ecosystem. And so how do you ensure that you are creating the flexibility that humans need while still maintaining the boundaries that they're st- sitting within? Absolutely. I'm reminded of a visit that I made to um, a company based in the United States that made uh, gunpowder. Oh, and uh, right. So it's it's a it's a very dangerous thing. So like if I wanted a smoke break on, on in the gunpowder plant, <laughs> I better make sure I'm not doing that right. like just around and, the corner. Yeah. Well, and there their concerns for safety extend way beyond just taking a smoke break in the on the plant floor <laughs> it's it, it went to having uh having 
cameras in the in the stairwells to make sure that everyone ascending or descending the stairs was holding onto the railing. And when you go into the parking lot, they have cameras in the parking lot and you must buckle up every single person in the car prior to starting the engine and and pulling away. So they have very, very, it's a very tight culture. And an organization like that needs to figure out how to bring some flexible tightness in order to preserve the human aspect of it. Mm-hmm. Now, the, the second part of this, this discussion then was about structured looseness, which was aimed more at like the tech type companies, you know, that are typically pretty loose. How do you bring structure in so that people can count on things? How do you have HR practices that are set up in such a way that people believe they're being treated fairly? You know, so so those are some of the things that I think are really beneficial for a loose uh, organizational ecosystem to think about how can they be structured in a way that actually promotes well-being within the organization. And so you guys talked about this idea that leaders need to be ambidextrous. So talk a little bit about that. Oh, I love I love this uh, the way Michelle talked about um, being ambidextrous, and it's leaders can't always just say, "Well, I'm just going to be tight on this," or "I'm always going to be loose on this." It doesn't matter. It does matter. Oh, so it's not if I'm a right-handed leader, I'm bad. I need to be an ambid. I need to be left <laughs> and right-handed. It's 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 a, a, a light, a tight, loose piece. I got it. Yes. I'm sorry. I was yeah. getting a little confused there. Yeah. yeah, it's not about left-handed or right-handed. No, it's about <laughs> it's about the tight loose thing, and and it's important for leaders to understand the context in which they're making decisions about about their organization. Um, so I, I thought that that was that was pretty cool. And then you also touch on cultural norms, and they matter, but they matter in different ways. What was that about? Yeah, well, again, she talks about the cultural ecosystem, which I I I love that love that term. Um, and she said that um, what we found. I'm just going to just going to quote Michelle here. She said, what we found in the study across numerous countries is that we found that in loose cultures, your values really predict your behavior very strongly. Okay. So just think about that for a second. Loose cultures, your values predict your behavior very strongly. Um, but, and I'm going to skip ahead in, uh, it's much less predictive in tight cultures where people tend to follow the norms. So in a, so in that, if I go back to the gunpowder manufacturer, it's not so about it's not so much about what you believe as much as it is about the social norms of everybody buckles up before they leave the parking lot before they even start the automobile that they're going to leave in. Well, that, and that that might even be because not even the social norms, but there's some there penalties, penalties and different pieces yeah. on that. But but to yeah. that, that's interesting when you talk about this idea that you know your values in the looser cultures predict your behavior, but your behavior is more predictable by social norms in tight cultures. In tight cultures, right. But in, in loose cool. cultures, That's yeah, it's, it's really much more cool. about your values. And yeah. and, and as you said before, culture or this tight looseness isn't necessarily always, it's a continuum and it's not always uh, country-based, but there's other factors that go into that. So right. I could, this could be complicated, couldn't it? It is, which I think is fantastic, right? That we don't, it, our world is much less binary than we tend to make it. And and I thought that that was great. And could I just add one, one other thing is I love that Michelle's work as a cross-cultural psychologist is interdisciplinary, that she's working with computer scientists and game theorists and big data people and linguists and neuro- neuroscientists. All to try to solve these tight, loose problems. Yeah. Try to, to try to understand these things that she's working with a broad variety of specialties, and I think that that's um, it's 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 insightful, it's meaningful, and it just kind of makes me happy too. So with that, I think that's a really great plug for getting people to go out and take the quiz that Michelle yeah. has on her website, yes. right? Because yes. that helps in some of that research and then that study and then being able to bring these insights so that it can make a better world or more informed decisions as we're moving forward. So absolutely. Okay. So Tim, I think it's about time we wrap up this grooving session and it's a good time to emphasize the fact that binary analysis may be fine at a micro level, but the world is a really complex area and we need to be, as Michelle said, ambidextrous when it comes to dealing with tight and loose issues. Yeah, I, I certainly agree, Kurt. Um, 
Michelle's interdisciplinary work and the cross-cultural work that she's doing are really on the forefront of where behavioral science can really contribute to the big picture, why we do what we do questions. And I'm excited. I'm just excited to see that happen. Yeah. So those wicked problems, right? That's some of the wicked problems. problems. There we go. Yeah. Um, and so again, please, if you get a chance and, you know, follow the social norms of all the other people that are going out and doing it, please leave us a quick uh, review of five star rating. If you feel like you're from a tight culture and if you're from a loose culture, just do it because it's the right thing to do and you want to do it, you know, because it goes a long way in helping us discover, get discovered by other people. That's what you really feel. So, you know, there you go. Beautifully placed, beautifully placed. And we hope that you heard something in Michelle's comments uh, in this episode that will help you this week go out and find your groove. Good enough. I think it works. Yeah, I think it worked nice. That was for you. Oh, I loved it. I liked asking you questions. Yeah.